High ankle sprains are a common injury in contact sports like football, rugby, and hockey. In this video, we'll go over the anatomy, diagnosis, and treatment of high ankle sprains. First, let's start off with a little bit of anatomy so that we're all on the same page. When we look at the bones of the lower leg, we have the tibia and the fibula. The tibia is the bigger bone on the inside, whereas the fibula is the smaller bone on the outside. And at the bottom in between these two bones, we have the anterior inferior tibial fibula ligament, which is the ligament that's injured with a high ankle sprain. Underneath the tibia and fibula, we have another bone called the talus. And this bone is important because if the foot goes into dorsiflexion, the talus can actually get wedged in between the tibia and the fibula, which can also stress the anterior inferior tibial fibular ligament. If we take a look at some of the other ligaments around the ankle, we have the anterior talofibular ligament, which is on the outside part of the ankle. This is the ligament that's injured with an inversion ankle sprain, which is the more common ankle sprain. And so if we just take a quick look at the proximity, we can see that the anterior talofibular ligament is pretty close to the anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament. So if we're just poking in the area, it can be difficult to actually isolate which ligament is injured because typically with both, we'll probably have a little bit of swelling, which can kind of cloud where the exact location of the pain is, which is why we'll actually have to use the mechanism of injury to determine if there's the high ankle sprain versus an inversion ankle sprain. And if we look at the mechanism of how a high ankle sprain occurs, it's with forced external rotation of the foot. And there's a couple of different ways that this can actually occur. One is with cutting, and so when our foot is planted and we cut and rotate, the foot is actually going into external rotation. And this could be made worse if we get tackled in this position because it'll drive the knee in, which will essentially drive the foot further out, putting stress on that anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament. Another common mechanism occurs when somebody is on the ground and somebody else lands on that lower leg, forcing that foot into external rotation. This is pretty common in contact sports, so if we look at something like football or rugby. And just for comparison, these mechanisms are different than an inversion ankle sprain where the ankle is forced into inversion. With either of these ankle injuries, it's important that we rule out a fracture. And typically the way that we do this is with something called the Ottawa rules. And so we're looking for tenderness in one of four different areas. One is on the posterior part of the lateral malleolus. One is on the posterior part of the medial malleolus. Then we also have the base of the fifth metatarsal as well as the navicular bone. If we have tenderness in any of these areas, plus the inability to bear weight or take some steps on that foot, then we should probably get an x-ray to make sure that there's no fracture. If there's no fracture and there's no instability in the ankle that would require surgery, then we can treat both of these ankle injuries with some sort of rehab program. For rehab exercises, initially we might want to avoid dorsiflexion and external rotation of the foot, generally because these are going to be painful and they're going to put stress on that anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament. Additionally, you might want to consider using an ankle brace, although it's not quite clear if an ankle brace is needed, and it probably depends a little bit on the severity of the ankle injury. A simple exercise to get started is a glute bridge, and this exercise actually serves two purposes, even though it might not be that obvious. The first is that it's going to start loading the ankle while minimizing the amount of dorsiflexion that the ankle is going to go into. It might not be a lot of load, but it just starts getting the ankle moving through some of that range of motion. The second part is that with ankle sprains, we actually see a reduction in glute activity. So this glute bridge is going to help strengthen that glute again, as well as kind of retrain that motor pattern. If tolerated, this exercise can be progressed to increase the loads on those calf muscles by bridging up and then lifting the heels up as far as we can go, and then slowly back down. If possible, perform these heel raises slowly, so try to do them over three to four seconds. And then finally, we can progress these exercises to a standing heel raise, which is going to further increase the loads on those calf muscles. So we want to perform these slowly. So it's a three to four second contraction up and then a three to four second contraction back down, initially starting with a straight knee to limit the amount of dorsiflexion that we're putting that ankle into. Additionally, we can transition these into a single leg calf raise, which is just going to further increase the loads while again, limiting the amount of dorsiflexion that we're going into. As tolerated, we can increase the amount of dorsiflexion by bending our knees and then repeating the same thing. So it's a three to four second contraction up and then three to four seconds back down to the ground. Next, we could add in some isolated strengthening for the other muscles around the ankle. This would include both dorsiflexion as well as eversion of the ankle using an exercise band. If it's still too painful to move into some of these ranges of motion, we could perform an isometric contraction where we're actually just contracting the muscles but not actually moving into those ranges of motion so that we can slowly build up the tolerance to those ranges. Once we've built up adequate strength of the muscles around the ankle and we've built up some tolerance to some different movements, then when we start looking at return to sport, we wanna make sure that the ankle is going to be able to tolerate higher loads. 
One example is resistant internal rotation of the foot. So we'd use an exercise band wrapped around the foot, which is going to try to pull our foot out into external rotation, but we wanna to try to keep the foot either pointing straight forward or even a little bit internally. And so initially we wanna perform these slowly where we're just gradually building up that strength, but then increasing the speed so that it has to work quicker as well. So we're working on some of that motor control aspect as well. We can also modify this exercise, so we're performing it at the end range of external rotation, as this is where injuries to that anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament occur. Therefore, it's an important range of motion for us to be strong in if we're looking at injury prevention. And then finally, we need to perform some plyometric exercises to get the ankle used to some of the movements experienced in sports. A double and single leg hop is a useful starting place to get the ankle used to some of those faster loads that are typically experienced with running. Then we can add in some lateral movements as well by performing a lateral hop, which more simulates some of the quick cutting motions that we'd experience with football or soccer. And then finally, we can perform some hops with rotation. And the key to selecting plyometric exercises is we wanna make sure that they're as similar as possible as the movements that we're going to experience in sport. So if our sport requires a lot of start and stops, we wanna make sure that the ankle's able to accelerate and decelerate quickly. If we do a lot more lateral movements, then we wanna make sure that our plyometric exercises are gonna make sure that the ankle is ready to tolerate those movements. So hopefully this video on high ankle sprains was helpful. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. I'll see you in the next video.